I would like to invite Dr. Kulreet Chowdhury to the stage. She's a neurologist, neuroscientist, and Ayurvedic practitioner. She's passionate about raising awareness for the need of a paradigm shift in contemporary medicine that focuses on patient empowerment and a health-based rather than disease-based medical system. So she will speak to us about um, building a smarter gut for a smarter brain. Thank you so much for being here. So it's a little bit of an occupational hazard to be the last speaker before lunch when we're running late. So we are going to do this um, as quickly as possible, but I always appreciate beginning e any talk with um, just an expression of gratitude. And so I first wanted to thank Dr. Schneider for taking most of the computer karma for the day. That was very gracious. I also wanted to um, thank Acharya Shunya, um, not only for your beautiful talk, but the picture that you had with the little boy and the butterfly. Um, it was, it's really a revelation to me how simple it is to connect with the divine and the awakening, not only of our Shakti, but our innocence. My son began growing butterflies, which I didn't know was a thing, um, but we suddenly started growing butterflies and watching them transform from caterpillar to cocoon and then having them come out and then they would fly onto his um, hands and stay on him because he had identified himself as the papa and all the butterflies were his um, daughters and so my son is hiding in his seat right now as I'm telling this story. Um, it was such a magical experience. It was very hard to describe kind of the uh, feeling as each one of these butterflies would come out and then sit on us. And as he was planting one of his milkweed plants in San Diego, so we're talking about San Diego, not India, um, he digs into the soil to put the seeds in and there is a little pendant, perfectly manifested um, Lakshmi pendant. And he goes, see, I told you the mother was happy with me. <laughs> and it just is such a testament to really how easy it is to um, invite the divine into your life um, if you can't do anything else, just grow butterflies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I was asked to speak about the brain-gut connection, and as I mentioned, um, in honor of your um, GI tracts and mine as well, we're going to do this rather quickly because we also have the pleasure of Dr. Keith Wallace speaking on this subject later on today, so I think we'll be adequately covered. But my story with my relationship with both the brain and gut is um, a very personal journey. So my mother had actually introduced us to Ayurvedic medicine, and it was in line with our introduction into transcendental meditation at nine years of age, and so Ayurveda became kind of part of our life. But then just like you know, all mature physicians, we go to medical school and very quickly forget everything that we had learned that was life-sustaining. And so I went through my medical education just like every other physician in training and then went on to neurology and came out um, essentially a shell physically of who I was before. Um, but you know, all of this energy up in the head, not only because I had studied um, the brain, but that's just the nature of modern medicine is we travel very quickly from the heart back up to the head. And I came out um, karmically, correctly, having migraine headaches, I suppose. But for me, it was no big deal because a neurologist having migraine headaches seemed like the easiest fix on the planet. So I pulled out my list of medications that I was placing all of my patients on and started going down one by one. Why wouldn't I? That was what I just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars learning to do, and it was really becoming my mantra at the time is, you know, if you got something wrong, you pull out a prescription pad and you fix it with a pill. So I started taking the medications myself, and I could not figure out if the side effects were worse than the headaches. And that's where many of us who kind of go into integrative medicine oftentimes find ourselves when we become dispassionate about our own medical training because it couldn't fix something we were experiencing. 
So I kept at it though, um, being Pitta, I persevered and just kept changing medications and I was going to find the right one until a year into it, I just, I couldn't do this anymore. And I always um, credit the person who led me back to the path um, because I ultimately turned back to my mother. Um, so after looking to specialists after specialists after specialists to try to fix this, my mother was the only one who had the correct answer. And she, yes, all the mothers in the room are clapping. <laughs> She also paid for my medical education, so <laughs> all, all good things kind of lead back to the past of my mother. Um, but she reminded me, you know, do you remember when you were growing up and uh, you were sick or even before we got sick, she would simply have us see the Vijas as they would come through from India. And so she reconnected me to the Vijas that would circulate um, from India to the U.S. And um, I went mainly because I didn't have any other choices. Oh, Robert, you did not take care of everything. So I walked in, and you know it had been quite a while now since I had gone in to see Avija, and you know here I see a gentleman from South India in his dhoti, and I'm walking in now with all of my sophisticated medical training, and so the first thing I do is naturally I roll my eyes. Um, and I sit down, and the first thing he starts to talk to me about is my digestion. My immediate response, not having remembered, you know, in my early years that this was all we discussed when we saw the Vaija, was this man clearly did not look at the reason I was here. I have headaches. I have no GI symptoms whatsoever. And so again, at this point, I really didn't have any other choices, so I sat through the entire evaluation. He felt my pulse, looked at me, and he said, you have very poor digestion. Again, looked back at him and said, yes, you have the wrong person. I came here for migraine headaches, but again, no other choices, so I followed his prescription. Within three months, I was completely headache-free, which was upsetting because it negated the last 20 years of my education. <laughs> I was thrilled that I didn't have headaches, but a little annoyed that none of my sophisticated education could get me to the same conclusion. But the really annoying part was I now, as a neurologist and, you know, a dharmic one at that, um, had to accept that the gut was, in fact, a major contributor to neurological disease. And so that was really how my journey began. It reconnected me to Ayurveda. I started my training in Ayurveda, both formally and informally. And I completely changed the way I practiced. And it was literally within two months, I went from a traditional neurology clinic at Scripps Memorial Hospital to a full-fledged Ayurvedic clinic, um, which I thought was gonna be against my patient's will, but they were absolutely thrilled that their neurologist was now talking about these things. And as it turned out, they were seeing all of these alternative practitioners on the side anyway. So we could now have <laughs> a monogamous relationship where we were actually sharing what was important to them. So this was really exciting to me, and I felt completely ready to conquer the world. And I really felt like, you know, neurology was just the beginning. There was nothing that would stand in our way. And so my patients were excited. I was excited. But what shocked me was that they absolutely struggled when it came time to change what they were eating. Now, I had the great luxury of practicing in a place where I had phenomenal patients. My patients were very smart, um, very hardworking, and they were multitasking wizards. And I really credit the caliber of the patients I had for much of the much of the work that came afterwards, because if it wasn't for the fact that they were so motivated, I think I would have missed this point altogether. So if I had all of these amazing patients, why couldn't, the cha why couldn't they change the way that they were eating? So I did the only thing I knew to do. I studied the problem. And it was interesting because I had the opportunity, I guess this was kind of, you know, nature's plan in giving me headaches, giving a neurologist headaches. 
um, was I got to approach it both as a neurologist and, and neuroscientist as well as a vaidya. And so instead of looking at it simply from the perspective of, um, well, they weren't motivated, um, I started to really look at what was going on here. Why couldn't these people change when they were able to organize their lives in other areas in an extraordinary way? And that's when I had my eureka moment. So it turned out that there were actually these obstacles to change. And these obstacles were biochemical in nature. They involved complex communication between the brain and the gut. And of course, Ayurveda had the tools to overcome these obstacles. And so this idea that many physicians pursue that people are unable to change because of willpower was completely false. So the first step was to identify the obstacles. So the first obstacle is this toxic overload. No, please, no bowing, no bowing. <laughs> there are more toxic chemicals in our food and environment than ever before. And this results in a new unprecedented need for detoxification in our modern world. Now, most people are often surprised when they hear that of the over 100,000 new chemicals that we have now created, less than 1% have actually been tested to be safe for human beings. And the majority of them are particularly toxic to women, which is why it's no surprise in the increase in autoimmunity favoring women over men. And so we have kind of this blind view of the world that there is some kind of angelic organization that oversees that we don't create things for profit that would directly harm human beings. And no such organization exists. And so because of this, we are now being exposed to toxic chemicals at an exponentially higher rate, a rate much higher than our body is able to actually process. In fact, it's not something that we have to worry about when we are 50 or 60 or 70 years of age. It turns out that from the very beginning, we are filled with these toxic chemicals. So the EPA did a study and they looked at newborn cord blood. So this is the blood that's connecting mom to babies from the, in the umbilical cord. And on average, this was average, 200 industrial chemicals and pollutants were found. So we're basically filled with toxins from day one of our life. So it's shifting just as, you know, we just talked about wanting to age well. It's the attention is really shifting, has to shift, I think, even before we hit our 50s and 60s to how are we bringing children into the world to begin with? What DNA damage has happened just in utero because of the exposure to all of these toxins? So there's a process called biotransformation, which many of you are probably aware of, but through this process, toxic byproducts are converted into water and fat-soluble forms so they can be safely eliminated or stored. And this is how we process most of our medications. There's another process called bioaccumulation where the toxic load exceeds the body's ability to convert it into a safer byproduct and it actually accumulates in the body. And this includes things like heavy metals, pesticides, PCBs. And unfortunately, as you go up on the food chain, they become more and more concentrated. And who is the highest on the food chain? Our babies are because they're drinking from mom's milk. So by the time that babies are drinking from mom, they've actually become the most concentrated, which is why we're seeing such high levels in newborn, in newborn babies. This essentially results in a toxic overload, a biochemical traffic jam in the body that has to be overcome before we can start to ask people to change what they are eating. Why? Well, because these unprocessed toxins, they seep into the gut, leading to gut permeability, or what we call leaky gut. They seep into the blood, resulting in autoimmunity. They seep into our brain, calling what I call leaky brain, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it damages the enteric nervous system, or the brain in our gut. Fun topic right before lunch. Man, I hope you, I hope you get us a healthy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have a mutiny. Yeah. <laughs> 
The second obstacle is food addictions. So food is actually being chemically designed for addiction. Now, this was really surprising to me, and I was surprised that it was surprising to me as a neurologist because I should have really known this. But food is made now with the consultation of food engineers or food scientists, and they're actually made to cause addiction. And so, of course, it would be difficult to change what you're eating. Now, the problem, of course, is in Ayurveda, that's the first thing we go to. We tell people, hey, change what you're eating. But now, if food is no longer food, and food is such a strong chemical that it's resulting in addiction, is that really a legitimate request to make as your first intervention? So our modern modified junk food causes dopamine spikes in the brain to create a heightened pleasure response. Now, dopamine is not at fault here. We need dopamine to help us to identify the things that are pleasurable, that help the human race to continue. And you know, I always remind people that if food felt awful to eat, we would be dead. If sex felt awful, again, dead, because why would we ever do it? So there's an appropriate role for dopamine, but what has happened here is that the food has been engineered to create such high dopamine responses that it's actually unnatural and the equivalent to the type of dopamine responses that you get from things like drugs. So asking a patient to change what she eats is like asking an addict to give up cocaine. And, you know, when I used to say this to my physician colleagues, they would say, oh, come on, talk about hyperbole, and then I would show them this. So this is actually a scan of three brains. The first brain is of a normal individual eating sugar. The second brain is an individual addicted to cocaine, taking cocaine, and the last brain is an obese individual eating sugar. And you can see how the brain is responding exactly the same way that it would respond to cocaine. So this is no hyperbole, it's just purely neuroscience. And this is usually the time when they would walk out of the room and say, I don't want to know this because it basically changes the way that we would have to look at our approach to food and the nervous system. So the third obstacle is what I lovingly refer to as the dumb gut. And the dumb gut is a combination of several different things. It's gut permeability or leaky gut, an imbalance in the gut flora, and damage to the enteric nervous system. So when I talk about damage to the enteric nervous system, which is the brain and the gut, I'm actually talking about brain damage that has happened in the GI tract. There is a brain in the gut, and it's a combination of the enteric nervous system and the gut flora. The job of this brain is to keep the gut and nervous system functioning properly. Now, the beauty of Ayurveda is we always talk about these two as really functioning as one, but this is such devastating information to the neurological community that despite all of the research on the microbiome, most of my colleagues still do not believe that there is any influence of the gut on the brain. The enteric nervous system is supported by healthy or symbiotic microbiome, and 90% of the DNA in your body actually comes from the bacteria in the gut. So really, you are more bacteria, genetically speaking, than you are human. And so if you want to not only live healthfully, but age healthily, you should take a look at which DNA should you be most conscientious of? Because if you're 90% bacteria, you should know who is growing within you and what they are actually doing. The enteric nervous system and gut flora impact behavior, and this has absolutely stunned me. Food choices is one, but all different types of behavior. There's a study that I talk about in my book.